If I am reading the dictator J. Trump tea leaves correctly, he has just revealed that if elected, he intends to prosecute Joe Biden for, quote, stealing, unquote, the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Yes, I am serious. Use the Department of Justice to prove the 2020 election was stolen from him and that it was stolen by Joe Biden. Under cover of that abortion ban three card Monty video at 1229 yesterday morning, Trump posted simply all caps Biden trials, three exclamation points that may have mystified truth social readers more than the plummeting value mystified truth social stockholders. But to others, those two words, Biden trials, were a simple confirmation of an Axios story that went right over the heads of everybody else in American politics, except a couple of us who also failed because we were too busy with the abortion. I'll leave it to the states, except I won't say I'll veto a ban overruling the states. Not so slight of hand abortion video. And the Axios story itself just scratched the surface here. In short, Biden trials? Trump is promising them. He did it on social media, cryptically, as always. But somebody in his campaign did it Monday when Axios quoted a source close to the Trump campaign as saying they plan to prosecute Joe Biden, presumably for classified document retention, for espionage, for corrupt business practices, for, I don't know, Stormy Daniels, for what this evil little Chuck Grassley spawn Mike Davis has called illegal foreign corruption. The quote to Axios, everything you have seen from the Biden DOJ, you can expect to see from the Trump DOJ. Everything? Unspoken in the Axios piece, I don't want to give them any ideas, but knowing Trump for 40 years as I do and watching his madness and his opportunities grow, when Axios quotes the proverbial source close to saying, everything you have seen from the Biden DOJ, you can expect to see from the Trump DOJ, I assume that it must be taken literally. And everything from the Trump viewpoint would include, would it start with some kind of funhouse mirror parallel in which Trump prosecutes Biden over the 2020 election. And what would that be? Trump prosecuting Biden for stealing the 2020 election. It has to be in Trump's mind. It has to be. One of the bedrock principles of Trump's life and his brain damage has been that for him to be innocent, somebody else has to be guilty. For him to be successful, Somebody else has to be a failure. It is not in the Axios piece. It is not in the two-word post. But what else matters to Trump? What else has he talked about? In his world, defeat is death. And he has been experiencing a living death since, bluntly, the moment Fox News called Arizona for Biden. All of this, since that moment, all of this, the attempt to overthrow the government of the United States of America. All of it, all of it since, all of it is about proving to everybody in the world for all time that he, Trump, did not lose, does not lose, cannot lose. Nothing more complicated than that. The world is secondary to Trump's need for everybody to agree he's right and all others are wrong. He would destroy the planet rather than admit defeat. Now, he might have to settle for lesser prosecutions of President Biden, or he might lay them out sequentially so that a Biden trial about 2020 happens closer to 2028 and becomes a rationale for violating the 22nd Amendment and seeking a third term in office. Remember his claims? that 2017 to 2021 didn't really count as a term because he'd had to spend so much time during it defending himself when he was, you know, caught accepting illegal foreign help in the 2016 campaign. He floated postponing the 2020 election or even somehow just being awarded or given re-election because he'd been so wrong and thwarted. 
And the idea of prosecuting Biden and proving somehow that he did not lose in 2020, it's just my guess, but I'm right. What Axios reported and the overnight Trump-Biden trials post hint at more immediately is the exact kind of politically motivated, factually starved, retributive, nothing but the revenge fantasies of a psychopath and his slaves actions that Trump has claimed the prosecution of his actual and amazingly large number of crimes is. The James Comer pile premature jocularity impeachment plot Once the centerpiece of Trump's evil has fizzled and floundered, but it is now morphing from something that was intended to assure Trump's election into something designed to follow it. Just yesterday, Comer went on Fox and insisted that the phony FBI informant Alexander Smirnoff, still in jail without bail as an international flight risk and still being prosecuted for having lied to the FBI, Comer now insists this guy Smirnoff, quote, wasn't relevant to the investigation. And he, Comer, is a victim of collusion by Democrats, the intelligence community, and the media to make it look like there is no longer going to be an impeachment. Well... We made it look like what it looks like by quoting Comer when he said that Smirnoff was, quote, a very crucial piece of the Biden impeachment probe, which is now resembling the last chapter of Moby Dick, where Captain Ahab not only does not get the whale, but winds up wrapped to the whale as the whale submerges and then rams his ship, killing everybody but Ishmael while America laughs. Moby Dick, starring James Comer as Dick. This does not mean that Comer will not be leaving a few harpoons for his own successors. He is now fundraising off a post-mortem promise noted in the Axios piece about Trump prosecuting Biden, a fundraising quote, that reads, Trump returns to the White House. It's critical the new leadership at the DOJ have everything they need to prosecute the Biden crime family and deliver swift justice. Criminal referrals. What would Trump want more than anything else? Some Trump-appointed judge somewhere? overseeing a trial at which it is declared that he was the rightful winner of the 2020 election and Biden was the one who stole it from him? I think if you made him that as an offer right now, he'd leave the country in exchange for that. While we, and I include myself among those distracted by the shiny object of that stupid abortion ban video, were distracted, Trump had, in fact, pulled off a total of at least two other masks. The removal of two other masks, besides the one in which he personally revealed plans to prosecute the president and his family. The second mask? He's letting a little bit more of his anti-Semitism show now. He has announced that American Jews who don't support him do not love Israel and, quote, should be spoken to. And then there is the third mask, the dictator mask. In brand new polling of those backing him, more than half of Republicans want him to rule without, quote, waiting for, without too much interference from the courts and Congress. In other words, they want a dictator. So remember... Whoever Trump picks as his running mate, he or she is a placeholder. His campaign is actually Trump Hitler 2024. The anti-Semitism mask pull off did not get a lot of play. It was late Monday night on an even for the genre obscure right wing nut job show on Real America's Voice hosted by a guy named Wayne Allen Root, who also just to up the ante wrote on Easter week, he has risen and so has Trump. Uh, here we go. Biden is is uh, no fan of Israel. Uh, any Jewish person that right. votes for Biden does not love Israel, and frankly, uh, it should be spoken to. 
Yeah, there's nothing dangerous or ominous in that, huh? Jews who support Biden hate Israel. Jews who vote for Democrats, quote, should be spoken to. And when would those votes for Democrats be? Well, in November. And so who would be speaking to them? Somebody in the government after a presumed Trump victory in 210 days should be spoken to. I have gone through this endlessly. Trump may or may not be an ideological anti-Semite. He may not carry with him some specific targeted madness against Jewish people. But so what? Any group he perceives as seeking his protection or interference, he exploits. Any group he perceives as vulnerable or disliked or easily persecuted, he scapegoats. And... Thanks to his mental illness, he has the capacity for the same group of people to be on both of those lists. He will seemingly protect and certainly exploit Jewish people now and scapegoat them later. Or do it all at the same time. Because the only real value any race, creed, color, or political affiliation has to this madman is what can they do for him at this moment? But... It is clear that his understanding, his comprehension of Jewish Americans is as shallow and prejudiced and as dangerous as was that of the German Nazis of Jewish Germans in, say, 1932. All his interactions with Jews are predicated on what he has done for Israel. The entirety of his conception of Jewish Americans is they are loyal first to Israel. Therefore, he has done things for Israel. Therefore, they owe him. Therefore, that is the oldest and most virulent anti-Semitic trope of them all. And no, they are not first on the Trump scapegoat list. Not now, anyway. The point, of course, is that it does not matter who is first. If we do not stop Trump now, he and those backing him will deliver an authoritarian, despotic, strongman rule America, and the crowds lining up to enable him and to support him and to defend him in this task, those crowds are growing. The Washington Post's Aaron Blake caveats the hell out of some of these numbers, and with reason, those Republicans who are strongly pro-dictator Trump are maybe half the total number quoted. Well, that's fine. So when you tell me that 57% of Republicans in the new Associated Press National Opinion Research Center poll believe Trump should be permitted to exercise unilateral executive power, quote, without waiting for Congress and the courts, 57% of Republicans say, yeah, Those who strongly believe that, that, that's only about 23%. So it's not like a majority of Republicans are ready for fewer Trump now. Only a quarter of them are. Another third or so are still waiting for, I don't know, Trump actually ruling without waiting for Congress and the courts. So they can walk around in it for a while and see how it fits. The Post's Blake has been keeping the receipts, though. He notes that the NPR PBS Marist poll from last week asking if people agreed things were so bad in this country that, quote, we need a leader who is willing to break some rules to set things right. Twenty eight percent of Democrats agreed with that. Fifty six percent of Republicans agreed with the idea that a leader is needed who will break some rules. Last month, it was the Reuters Ipsos poll. Does the nation need a, quote, strong president who should be allowed to rule without too much interference from courts and Congress? Again, 29 percent of Democrats agree. You guys are scaring me, but you are not scaring me as much as the percentage of Republicans who agreed, which was 52 percent in February. UMass Amherst asked Republicans about Trump's promise to be dictator for a day. Three quarters of them approved of that. In December, Fox did a poll where they literally asked how Republicans felt about letting the president do a little criming. 
Do we need a commander in chief, Fox asked, who will break some, quote, rules and laws, unquote. Note, note, and laws. 30% of Trump's 2020 voters said yes. Break some rules and laws. Well, once your president has broken some laws, and I mean, lots of laws, what's the diff at that point? I mean, the day Nixon quit, 34% of America approved of his performance as president or had no opinion on it. 34. Trump only got that approval from 30% of his voters in 2020, letting him break some more laws. Hey, Trump, you're not trying hard enough. And, oh, by the way, Trump's abortion ban video from Monday, the one I suggested he would repudiate or weasel out of or have others do so for him, he's already done it. The president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, Spapla, slammed Trump for that video and his supposed stance against a national abortion ban. Then... They got on the phone, and she talked to him about his read the fine print video, supposedly opting out of a national ban, and then she came out and said of Trump and the national ban, quote, he will get there. Yesterday, as you know, the Arizona State Supreme Court said a law passed during the Civil War, before Arizona became a state, before the slaves were freed, nearly 60 years before women had the right to vote. That law is in effect now, and it bans all abortions except to save the life of the mother. And the Republican Senate candidate, Carrie Lake, immediately condemned the law and said the Democratic governor should make sure it's repealed and adjusted, which was hilarious because two years ago, Carrie Lake praised that law and said it should be enforced. And if Lake's Looney Tunes idiocy did not push Arizona to lean Democrat by itself, Oh, by the way, there's also likely to be an abortion rights referendum on the ballot in Arizona in November. So, yeah, Trump lied about his stance about a national abortion ban. He lied poorly. He convinced only some of the evangelicals who support a national ban that he does not. And the GOP is going right off the cliff on this. So the gist of where we are today is Trump, right now, 210 days out from the election, is promising the prosecution of Joe Biden and presumably his son and presumably his dog. He may be talking about prosecuting Biden about the 2020 election. I think so. And his campaign worms are leaking broad details about prosecuting Biden. Trump has just said American Jews who don't support him, quote, should be spoken to, presumably by his government. And 52 percent, 56, 57 percent of Republicans think Trump should be able to rule without waiting for Congress or the courts or the laws. And his internal polling on how much killing Roe v. Wade is killing his campaign clearly led him to make this con man video in which he implies but never says he's opposed to a national abortion ban and then reassures all the national abortion ban evangelical leaders that he was just lying about that. So what do we do? Well, I have saved the good news for the end. As of the close of the polling day last night, Biden is now ahead in 10 major polls released in just the last two weeks. He has just moved ahead in the Economist poll tracker by 46 to 45 over Trump. He is three tenths of one point behind in the right leaning RCP poll average. And he has gone from behind to ahead thusly. Now plus one in data for progress, plus one in noble predictive polling, plus two in the Emerson poll, plus two in NPR Marist, plus two in Big Village, plus two in Morning Consult, plus three in Quinnipiac, plus three in McLaughlin plus three in tip, plus four in Marquette. And there are eight polls in the swing states where he trailed inside of the last month and now leads. That's the good news. The bad news is Biden goddamned better win because whatever you think about what would be in another Trump presidency, it is clear 
It is far, far worse than that. Also of interest here, so it started as Geraldo Rivera. Remember Geraldo Rivera? Geraldo Rivera, who never met a successful person he wasn't jealous of, attacking Larry David. Because Larry David had had the nerve to leave when Geraldo tried to introduce himself at an Alan Dershowitz party. It's celebrity Mad Libs. Then... Geraldo attacked Barack Obama because the president would not come over to the party to meet Geraldo Rivera. Then I got involved because Geraldo started taking shots at me in 1997, and I felt somebody with that kind of level of experience with this schmuck needed to point out that Geraldo Rivera had never figured out what it means when nobody wants to meet you. Then, Geraldo tried to attack me, too, on Twitter X, but genius that he is, first... He blocked me. Then he wrote mean things about me. But of course, since he had already blocked me, I couldn't read it. Super genius. The worst persons in the world. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Oberman. Ahead of us on this edition of Countdown, the greatest scoop of my sportscasting career came when I did nothing more than continuously answer the phone as viewer after viewer called in to tell me the owner of the LA Kings had just told them at a golf course that he was about to trade for Wayne Gretzky. But the second greatest scoop of my sportscasting career came because I really wanted some pizza. So I happened to be walking past the bar across the street from the pizza parlor, and I was walking at the exact moment the exact guy who had the exact info I needed stepped out of the bar and started yelling that info at the top of his lungs. The George Steinbrenner story and things I promised not to tell next. First... Still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger FX specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. We start with the bronze. Worse, the DFB, the German Soccer Federation, which is now redesigning its avant-garde Adidas jerseys. Okay, I'll pretend to be a soccer hipster. Redesigning its Adidas kit redesigning them after a small problem turned up with the uniform number 44. Now, the German national soccer teams do not issue number 44 shirts, so this would not have come up in reality, obviously, for each of the men's and women's squads, but there's nothing preventing fans from buying customized, personalized Germany 44 jerseys on the site of the manufacturer. See, the problem is the new jerseys used a font for the numbers, in which that four is, as they say, open, like in the Corbell font or October Condensed Tamil. So the main upright line of the four, the thing on the right, it does not connect with the slanty line on the left of the four, which in fact is almost not slanty at all. It's almost upright. Can you see it in your mind? The four is not just not connected, it's open. It also kind of looks like a broken tuning fork, or it looks kind of like a stylized letter S, very angular, very sharp. Dad was an architect, can you tell? The numbers are also slightly angled, so the crossbar on the four actually goes up a little from the left side of it to the right side of it. So now, now picture it if you ordered a number 44 jersey with its open fours and its upright slanties and on the back of a German uniform, the 44 looks like an S. Well, it's two fours, so it looks like two S's. So instead of looking like 4-4 four, four, 44, it looks like SS. Oh, I see the problem. The German national team says it regrets its negligence. 
It is disabling customized Germany jersey sales, and it'll be redesigning the fours on its uniforms going forward, and it feels great shame. You know, if they have a bunch of those German 44 SS unis, though, they can probably sell them at a great profit to the Republican Party. The runners-up were, sir, the Republican Party, specifically Tim Sheehy of Montana, another one of these fine Senate candidates the GOP keeps unearthing. There's Eric Hovde in Wisconsin, the 60-year-old guy who's trying to look 50, and instead he wound up looking like the guy who used to be on the brawny paper towel wrapper, only like a torn-up wrapper. Hovde says since people in nursing homes shouldn't get to, to vote because they're all going to die soon anyway, that guy. Then there's Carrie Lake, who, as I mentioned earlier, yesterday condemned the 1864 Arizona abortion law as it went back into effect two years after praising the 1864 Arizona abortion law and demanding that it go back into effect. And then there's this guy, Tim Sheehy. He is an ex-Navy SEAL, and so far his campaign to unseat John Tester for the Senate in Montana has been that he, Sheehy, is so tough that he's still got a bullet in his arm that he got while fighting in Afghanistan. Or he's so tough that he's still got a bullet in his arm that he got while dropping his gun while he was packing up his SUV in a parking lot and the gun was loaded and not locked and when it hit the ground it discharged and he managed to shoot himself with his own gun even though he wasn't holding his own gun at the time and he's just damn lucky he still has his testes intact or his skull. That's what he told the National Park Service ranger at Montana's Glacier National Park, according to the record. That's why they took him to the hospital. That's why he had to explain it to the ranger and why he was fined $525 for illegal discharge of his gun in a national park. But now, now that he's saying it was suffered in Afghanistan, now she, he says, that was all a lie. Just to explain to the ER staff why he had a bullet in his arm, even though he says he got shot in Afghanistan in 2012, and that in 2015, when he'd fallen on the ice at the park, uh, that would have been three years later. Of course, a fall on the ice and a three-year-old gunshot wound look exactly the same. And he's not lying now. He was lying. And he was only lying because he was shot by friendly fire and he was protecting his military team from an investigation. And sure, later in a book he wrote, he explained about the friendly fire. But that's different because by then it was too late for an investigation. And, 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 and so either, either his buddy shot him or he shot himself in a parking lot accident. The guy's a liar. Just a question of when. And oh, by the way, just to ratchet this up a bit, this man Sheehy has bought a bunch of ads on Twitter X for his right to bear arms and or shoot yourself in the arm campaign for the Senate from Montana. And the key phrase in his ad that he uses is, this is no joke, fellow conservative. I have a giant target on my back. <laughs> oh, so now the bullet's in your back, buddy? I have a giant target in my back. Don't let me shoot me. But our winner, the worst, Geraldo Rivera. Oh, sweet Jesus on hockey skates. So this preening, clueless weasel follows up the day after the Curb Your Enthusiasm finale, slamming it, slamming Larry David because Larry did not want to meet him. Quote, I'm not a fan because Larry truly is the self-righteous, snobby, self-loathing, narcissistic ass he portrays. Geraldo Rivera says there was a birthday party for Alan Dershowitz in Martha's Vineyard and Rivera and Larry were both at it. Wait, hasn't Dershowitz spent like the last three years insisting that because he defended Trump, they wouldn't let him into any Martha's Vineyard parties anymore? So he's the real January 6th victim here? Anyway, here Geraldo is being good enough to keep digging, and I'm interrupting him with my little asides about Alan Dershowitz and parties. To continue, quote, I spotted Larry in the crowd and walked toward him. Instead of making at least nominal polite contact, Larry ostentatiously avoided even looking in my direction. He actually scurried about in theatrical panic, ducking behind other guests, Groucho Marx style, as he made sure to keep a safe distance. 
Now, uh, you or I would probably be smart enough to understand what had happened here, and we would keep Larry David's desperate attempt to flee rather than to meet us to ourselves. In fact, I'm not sure about you, but I would have taken this humiliation with me to my grave. <laughs> not Geraldo Rivera. He paid for that ripping blue check mark and he's gonna use it larry who i've never met oh wait that's the point right i mean he successfully avoided meeting you hilarious i mean geraldo larry who i've never met apparently was taking his cue from the famous fox hater renting the big place next door visible through the bushes separating the properties president barack obama refused to make the two-minute walk over to dersh's place for the same reason fear of fox so wait now geraldo larry david refused to meet you because this was a conspiracy directed by barack obama thanks obama Gee, Geraldo, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to meet you. Now, every time I see Larry being crude, rude, and intolerant on television, I say, that's him, that really is Larry David, and he's not acting. Now again, as I've mentioned before, I'm not a close friend of Larry David's. I think we, we visited twice, we had lunch once, a lovely lunch with Bill Sheft here in New York several years ago. But I find him delightful. He, he did the introductions for the show. He, he, he managed to do that. Do you know what, what is involved in getting him to record something like that? He's a lovely guy. And very, the best, absolutely the best audience in the world. Laughed at my jokes as if I were funny compared to him. Also, I've never met Geraldo Rivera. But Geraldo Rivera has been taking weird shots at me. Not as weird as insisting Obama had told me whatever you do don't shake Geraldo Rivera's hand it's a conspiracy to keep Geraldo Rivera from meeting Larry David sure it is okay you're fine you don't have mental problems but nevertheless Geraldo Rivera has been taking weird shots at me since 1997 in 2003 when I got back into cable news I called him out on the air now I was not alone in this, and I wasn't even at the forefront of this. I did this along with most of America when, while with a U.S. military unit during the Iraq War, Geraldo Rivera went on Fox, made an on camera presentation in which he did some drawing in the sand, and to quote the Pentagon, the commander felt that he, Rivera, had compromised operational information by reporting the position and movements of the troops. The U.S. military ordered Geraldo Rivera out of Iraq. It was in all the papers. And I reported it on MSNBC, and then he called me a punk or something, and then four years later, I referred to him as Bill O'Reilly's sidekick on Fox, and he called me a, quote, coward who wouldn't walk across the street against the red light, and he said he was ready to fight me. And I should be scared, because Geraldo Rivera owned a machete and a mustache. Gee, Geraldo, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't want to meet you. Actually, this whole thing does stem back to 1997. He had a show on CNBC, and MSNBC hired me to do its 8 p.m. show, and, and MSNBC and NBC News spent some money on ads on buses in New York City and, and, and a lot of ads in newspapers, ads that showed me and Brian Williams, who did the 9 o'clock show on MSNBC, back-to-back. Back. You get it? <laughs> we were on it. I didn't get back-to-back. Supposedly, they spent a million dollars on advertising, but most of that would have been on MSNBC, and they counted it for accounting purposes. Well, in any event, Geraldo Rivera went ballistic about these ads. He complained to one of the political newsletters on the record, and they printed it, and I've got it somewhere in my files. He went on the record with one of the political newsletters saying it was outrageous and offensive that NBC was spending its ad money on me rather than on him. So, this takes us back to the present moment. Rivera puts out this sad, self-owning, amazingly self-unaware tweet about Larry David joining the former president of the United States on what is apparently a long, long, long list of people who would rather run than meet Geraldo Rivera. And I replied to Geraldo's tweet or post or whatever it was with a short but accurate insult. Well, this set him off again. 
As you may have noticed, it's not difficult to set him off. But remember, he's a star. He works for, checks notes, News Nation, which in the January ratings averaged 75,000 viewers, which is nearly three quarters of the audience of this podcast. And it only costs News Nation tens of millions of dollars to produce News Nation, whereas I do this in my suit closet with the help of my dogs and an iPad. So, Geraldo wrote something nasty about me in response about how he didn't know I was still alive. Now, I would have mentioned all this yesterday, but of course I did not know that Geraldo had written this really uh, novel thing about how he didn't know I was still alive. I did not know it until much later because Geraldo, being a genius, blocked me on Twitter X, then wrote his very original snarky reply, which is how you would do it also if you were too afraid that the guy you were insulting might actually read what you wrote, which is, I guess, what happened. All I know after that was, of course, of course he did not know I was still alive. You've seen his work? He pretty much doesn't know an effing thing. All because after that long screed against Larry David, I had replied, quote, Maybe everybody hates you just because you suck. So, Geraldo, maybe everybody does hate you just because you suck. Rivera, today's worst person in the world! Now from the files of things I promised not to tell, and I recently went past the building, my second professional home, and I was flooded with my memories of a place called... The RKO Radio Network. This is 1980, and I'm nearing my 22nd birthday, and I'm working real hard at one radio network run by the United Press International Wire Service in my second year and making around well, nearly $20,000 a year. And in September, a drunken manager had tried to get me fired, tried to fire me himself for being young. And I'll be damned if I can remember getting consecutive days off there. This was UPI in a nutshell. For my first few weeks there, I thought whoever had decorated the newsroom had found the floor tiles with the ugliest design pattern in history. And then finally, I saw a colleague grind his lit cigarette into that floor. And only then did I realize that was what the ugly design pattern was. Hundreds of ground out cigarettes. Years and years of ground-out cigarettes in the tiles. Anyway, the main advantage to working at UPI was that everybody in what was then a flourishing radio business knew UPI, and thus they knew you, and they knew you were underpaid. The top all-news radio station in the country, WCBS in New York, had already asked if I might be a candidate for a coming opening in their sports department, the previous spring, I'd actually interviewed with two vice presidents at this thing the yachtsman Ted Turner, who owned the Atlanta Braves, was going to try to start, something he called Cable News Network. But they were not initially interested in me, and after meeting with them, I was certain they would never get it launched, let alone get an audience for it. I was working there literally 14 months later. I'd also been flown to Boston, like they spent $55 on me by a radio station that really wanted me to do a morning sports shift for them, and they were offering $40,000 a year, twice my salary, and I was ready to do it, and I was sitting in the office in Boston trying to figure out where I could live and how late I could sleep and still get there in the morning. And then the news director said, now, except if there's a big story, you can do the afternoon sportscast from home over the phone, which is when I realized I was supposed to do the morning and the afternoon, I was essentially on the clock from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m., and the $40,000 would have had to go to my sister because the schedule would have killed me within three months. And then there was this RKO radio network. UPI was in the unique position of having RKO as a client. So RKO heard and used our stuff all the time. And also, 
They had from their beginning used our UPI feed as a kind of 24-7, constantly flowing, turned on spigot audition service. From the time I got to UPI in July 1979, it seemed like one radio person from UPI per month was hired away by RKO. Sometime in the early autumn of 1980, I was covering a New York Rangers game at Madison Square Garden, and the guy next to me smoking a cigar inside the garden, right in front of all the fans, turned out to be the sports director of this RKO network. In fact, he was the entirety of the RKO sports department. But we're doubling in size. I'm going to start doing weekend sportscasts, and I get to hire a new person to do the weekends. Mm, it's a union shop, so it's $51 a sportscast after. There's 10 a weekend, so you get uh, 22 for any dollars for reports for uh, reports from the field, and, and you'd be my backup. 22 bucks from the field. And a guarantee of 510 a weekend. And you got to come in uh, one day a week uh, to book the stringers for the weekend games. Uh, that'd be free. But the guarantee is $26,000 plus those uh, $22 every time you file a report from the field. You interested? Well, I did some quick math. This was about 40% more money for about 40% less work. And there were no 5 a.m. to 6 p.m. schedules. When the sports director called me back a few weeks later to offer me the gig, I did not hesitate. His name, by the way, was Charlie Steiner. Charlie would later be a colleague of mine at SportsCenter, and then he did the Yankees games, and now he does the Dodgers games, and he's been a friend for 42 years. The network itself was also space-age shiny and new, and it had carpets. Whereas UPI had the stubbed-out cigarettes decor, RKO was literally the first radio network in this country to deliver all of its programs to its stations via satellite. No more scratchy, hyper-expensive phone lines. RKO came through crystal clear, and that was our pitch to the stations. All the newscasts, all the sportscasts, all the features ended with the same tagline. Via satellite, this is the RKO radio network. And then a spot for Hubba Bubba Gum. For my first few weeks there, part of the job also included doing two sports casts a day for RKO's local station, WOR. The first time I went up in the elevator to their studio, it dawned on me that it was the exact same studio where seven years before I had been invited by the great comedians Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding, along with my dad, to sit and watch in amazed appreciation as Bob and Ray did their show on WOR. So basically, as of December 1980, I had accomplished all of my childhood goals. The only problem with the place was the location. RKO was on the southeast corner of Times Square, at probably the low watermark in the history of Times Square. It was in 1440 Broadway at the corner of 40th Street, there was a back door at 41st Street and 6th Avenue right across from Bryant Park. On those occasions, when I filled in for Charlie Steiner on the weekdays for his morning show, which they would tape overnight, I would often be at the studios until 2 or 3 a.m. and my walk home was a, a little sketchy. In point of fact, I would not walk home. I would run. I mean run, run from that back door at 41st and 6th. I'd pass Bryant Park on my right as fast as I could, past all the drug dealers and other folks, then dart on the north side of 42nd between 6th and 5th. And once you got to that corner of 5th and 42nd, you were back in civilization with good street lights and other people on the streets, no matter how late the hour, or as we called them in New York then, witnesses. Occasionally, I might have to walk in Times Square itself, usually when it was daylight, what surrounded me there was about as far from today's Disneyland East Times Square as you could imagine. In fact, you could not imagine. There were porn theaters everywhere. And it wasn't just porn theaters. They were spaced apart. And in between them, other businesses existed. Porn peep shows, porn sex shops, and porn video rental stores. I remember always making sure I was walking on the outside edge of the street, nearest the gutter, on the premise that in the event somebody tried to mug me, I stood a much better chance by running right out into automobile traffic. Besides which, I used to worry that if I walked too close to the porn theaters and the shows and the shops and the video stores, one day I might just get stuck to the sidewalk. 
Times Square was so different in 1980 and 1981 that I really can't imagine that the annual income made there from anything but porn and the RKO radio network was more than $20 a year in total. There was nothing else. I mean, nothing. On weekends, walking over from my home on the east side, I would decide which fast food place I'd be getting lunch from. Somewhere on Fifth Avenue or Lex, I'd go to the nearest payphone, I'd call the RKO newsroom desk, and I would offer to bring in food for everybody for the simple reason that in Times Square, 40 years ago, there were no restaurants open on weekends. I'll say that again. In Times Square, 40 years ago, on the weekends, all the restaurants that existed there were closed during the day. And forget public transportation to Times Square. I would finish my brisk 25-minute walk to work one night in that frigid winter of 1980-81 and see my colleagues looking unusually pasty and drawn. You didn't take the subway in, did you? Asked one of the editors, Tom Ryan. I looked at him like it was crazy. Well, good. Some guy got stabbed by the stairs closest to our building. I asked if he was okay. No, he's not okay. He's dead. But they got the guys who did it. They arrested 51 people. One guy got stabbed to death. 51 people were arrested. I asked if they had been restaging a reenactment of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Still, the equipment was brand new and easy to use, and the staff was all young. We all had fun, and we had parties, and everybody lived in the city, and for the most part, it was a pleasure to work there. And it was way more lucrative even than Charlie Steiner had suggested. Those $22 voice reports from the field, they piled up fast. The baseball players went on strike that June 1981, and every time I covered a bargaining session, I could be certain of at least another $44, and if that doesn't sound like much... The rent on my very nice studio apartment never got higher than $498 a month. RKO's location also provided me with some wacky logistical problems. I filled in for Charlie on most holidays, plus I did the same thing at a local radio station, WNEW. This made the actual Christmas into my metaphorical Christmas. If I had to fill in for both of these operations on the same day, my schedule went like this. Get into RKO in Times Square at maybe 2 a.m. Tape Charlie's morning show by 4 a.m., then walk across town very quickly to WNEW over on 3rd Avenue and do those sportscasts live between 5.30 and 9 and then go home and maybe take a nap, but not a long one because I would have to be back at RKO by 1 p.m. to do Charlie's afternoon show. Rinse, repeat. A lot of work. On the other hand, just one week of those days paid the rent for two months. On a wet New Year's Eve 1981, I treated myself to a cab to go to RKO, which put me in the bizarre position of getting into a cab on the east side at 1.30 a.m. New Year's morning and saying, take me to Times Square. And the driver saying, you missed it, buddy. It's been 1982 for an hour and a half. Nothing like being the only person going into Times Square while one million people are leaving it. Drunk. Most of the sports casts I did at RKO were pretty textbook, but there did come the day that I walked in to fill in for Charlie, who was at Wimbledon, so this is the summer of 1981, and the news wires were full of this story of some unnamed American radio reporter getting into a brawl with a London tabloid writer at a Wimbledon press conference, and it slowly evolved that the reporter was Charlie, my boss, and we were going to have to figure out a way to cover this. At first, Charlie wanted to do it in the third person and say, the reporter did this, and the reporter said that, and I said, you know, I really don't think we're going to get away with that. Given how much wire copy I'm seeing here, Charlie, this is probably going to be on the front page of the New York Times in the morning. Sure enough, it was above the fold. Worse still, unbeknownst to Charlie, his fight took place in a corner of the Wimbledon press room, right under the camera that fed out a shot of that room 24-7 to every television network in the world. Sure enough, the last item on ABC's 6.30 newscast that night with Peter Jennings was a feature 
on Charlie Steiner fighting with the British over how they broke up the John McEnroe post-match press conference, and he was pissed off because that meant he wouldn't get any sound bites from McEnroe. I managed to run home from RKO and record the report by Dick Schapp, and when Charlie got back from London, I loaned it to him. This was in July 1981. Charlie still hasn't given me the tape back. Every time I see him, he swears he's still looking for it. It's in a box somewhere. But I'm beginning to think he may not be telling me the whole truth about what happened to my video cassette. But my favorite RKO story is about Charlie's sudden and inexplicable obsession with the story during that 1981 baseball strike I mentioned. In the middle of this thing, which stopped the season for 50 days and was really, really the beginning of the end of that time when baseball truly mattered in this country. When every day of that strike, somebody on all the TV newscasts said, and the baseball strike is in its 23rd day, a story broke that George Steinbrenner, the owner of the Yankees, was going to meet with baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn and a couple of other owners who realized that the work stoppage was financial madness. As George told me years later, he was losing about a million dollars in revenue every day so that the Milwaukee Brewers could save $5,000 in salaries every year. Well, my boss, Charlie Steiner, decided he was going to scoop the world about this secret steinbrenner Kuhn meeting, so he told me to come into the office on one of my off days and work the phones. Work the phones, son. Two of us, me and the newly hired producer, my friend John Martin, were supposed to call everybody we knew and find out for Charlie when these guys were meeting and where and who would be there and to not go home until we had nailed it down. Well, it was madness. I didn't know anybody in baseball, let alone anybody who knew where the owner of the Yankees was going to meet in secret with the commissioner of baseball, let alone who knew all that and would tell me. But I tried everybody I could think of and had already suggested to John Martin that I was just going to start dialing 10 digits at random and asking whoever answered if they knew when, after about eight hours of this, well past my dinner time, I was on the phone with some executive of some West Coast team when he said, hold on a minute, I've got another call. And a moment later, from the adjoining room in my office, I heard John Martin say, hey, Mr. Smith, hi, this is John Martin from the RKO Radio Network, and, uh, yes, RKO Radio Network. Yes, I'll hold, sir. Mr. Smith picked up my call again and said, is this really two of you calling me about this crap at the same time from the same network? And I said, yes, and I apologized, and I told him I was going home. If Charlie doesn't like it, I told John, he can fire me. So follow me on this. Because I had missed dinner, when I got back to my street on the east side, I was famished. I don't know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock? The last two blocks of my walk home was always identical. I'd come up 3rd Avenue and then hang a right at the southeast corner of 3rd Avenue and 55th Street. I lived at the other end of 55th Street near 2nd Avenue. But now I was going to go pick up some pizza in a very nice place on the northwest corner of this same block. I got the slices, the lights changed, and now I was crossing towards the northeast corner of 55th and 3rd, which itself was the home of a famous New York bar, P.J. Clark's. Ordinarily, I would never have been on that side of the street at that hour, but there I was. And as I slipped past the ancient front door, I saw the side exit open and a burst of bright yellow light, like in an Edward Hopper painting, shoot out onto a limo waiting on 55th Street. And as I walked, carrying my box of pizza and wearing my RKO Radio Network black jacket, who emerges from that light of that side door at P.J. Clark's but George Steinbrenner in a tux? I gasped. I tried to summon the courage to approach Steinbrenner as he walked towards his limo and ask him about his planned meeting with Commissioner Kuhn. And just before I admitted to myself that no... At the age of 22, I did not have such courage. I saw Steinbrenner stop at the limo, and I heard him yell back towards the light shining through the still open side door to Clark's. Eddie! Eddie! And with that, Edward Bennett Williams, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, leaned out, also in a tux, and said with evident exasperation, What now, George? Steinbrenner shouted, What time are you and I and Childs meeting with Bowie tomorrow? 
I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my luck. Williams had not seen me. Steinbrenner had not seen me. Williams sighed again. For the tenth time, George. 9.30. 9.30 in the morning, George. 9.30. Bowie's condo. I now plastered myself against the wall of Clark's. I hoped they had not seen me at all. Without so much as asking the question, I had learned that the Orioles owner and Childs, Eddie Childs, the owner of the Texas Rangers, they would be accompanying Steinbrenner to the meeting, and it would begin at 9.30 at the condominium of Commissioner Bowie Kuhn. And I was wondering if I could try to fake Steinbrenner's voice and shout, Eddie, where is Bowie's condo again? When suddenly I heard Steinbrenner say, Eddie, where is Bowie's condo again? By now, Edward Bennett Williams had relit a cigar he was holding. George, write it down this time. 575 Park. 575. I could barely breathe. Good God, they had handed me everything but the cross street. Eddie, Eddie, what's the cross street? Williams now swore. Oh, for F's sake, George, 63rd, 63rd and Park, 575 Park at 930 in the morning, okay? Steinbrenner got into the limo. It squealed off. The door closed. I wrote what I had heard on the top of the pizza box and took off at a dead run to my apartment at the corner of 55th and 2nd, pausing only to take a quick bite of pizza. I called John Martin back at the RKO Radio Network. I got it. John said, you got what? I got everything about the meeting. John said, I'll get the boss. Soon, all three of us were on the phone. Charlie did not believe I had gotten him any information, so I laid it on thick. You writing this down, boss? 9.30 tomorrow morning. It's at Bowie Coon's condo at 575 Park. That's the corner of 63rd, of course. Then there was silence at Charlie's end of the phone. Oh, and... uh. Edward Bennett Williams of the Orioles and Eddie Childs of the Rangers, they'll be there too. I, I don't know, Charlie, if it's just them or there are others, but but those four will certainly be there. Bowie's condo, 575. Cross Street is 63rd. Charlie started to make a kind of butt, butt noise. But 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 how did you find out? How in the hell did you actually find out? Why do you think it's true? I had been waiting for this for several moments, and my answer had been rehearsed in my mind at least as far back as my elevator ride up to my apartment. With the most nonchalant I had ever mustered in my life, I answered Charlie Steiner. Well, Charlie, I I ran into Steinbrenner at Clark's. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. It was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. Sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, and it was written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc., Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was, once again, two days in a row, an all-time first, my friend Larry David. Because me and my friend Larry David, we both hate Geraldo Rivera. Everything else was just pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for this, the 210th day until the 2024 presidential election the 1,191st day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment. Use the not regularly given elector objection option. Use the Insurrection Act. Use the justice system. Use the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.